Well, this morning we're beginning our Advent sermon series entitled Foretold. And our passage for the sermon is Isaiah 7, starting in verse 1. Will you stand with me now as we hear the reading of the inerrant, inspired, authoritative word of God? Starting in verse 1. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Bash, here we go, Shear Jash Ub, got it. Your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands. At the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it. And let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol and, or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask and I will not put the Lord to test. And he said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not yet come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. And we pray now that you would be with your servant, Pastor Trent, as he preaches the word to us. May it strike our hearts and give us, above all, hope, because you are our Lord and King. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome. As we get started, I just wanted to point out the trees. Aren't they pretty? Yeah. They are beautiful. And uh, we have um, two of our staff members, Harriet and Madison, as well as a volunteer, Juliet Winokur, did all of this. The trees out there and here, they did an amazing job. I'm so thankful. <laughs> and it reminds me, so many things are being done all the time by both our staff, but especially by our volunteers, you. And we thank you for the things that you're doing. They're behind the scenes. Maybe they're not as obvious as these trees that fill the stage, but they matter. And we appreciate you. And if you're not already serving the church, you can make a difference in uh, the accomplishment of our mission here by getting engaged in service in some particular way. So we hope that you'll do so uh, now, or if you want to wait till the new year as a resolution, that's fine too. But um, we hope that you'll join us in serving. Now, fear can make us do some really foolish things. And that, story, that, that, that reality is illustrated in the life of a man named Charles Jenkins. Charles was born in North Carolina, born and raised there. He was a, a good soldier in the U.S. Army. He had been promoted to sergeant. He even had been awarded a good conduct award by one of his commanding officers. But all of that changed in January of 1965. He had been stationed near North Korea, the near the demilitarized zone. And one night, after about 10 years of planning and after downing about 10 beers for courage, he tied a white T-shirt around his rifle 
held it up into the air and walked across the line into North Korea, surrendering himself to the North Korean army. That decision he made that day would affect the next 40 years of his life as he became a prisoner of the North Koreans. He would not be released until after 40 years when he was able to return to the United States and as a 64-year-old man faced court-martial and tearfully acknowledged before the judge that I am, in fact, guilty. Now, what would cause a guy who's an otherwise good soldier, good upstanding man, to defect from the U.S. Army, to leave behind his friends, to break his oath, to go and surrender himself to the North Koreans, what would cause a person to do that? Fear. Fear. He was afraid. By his own admission, he was afraid that his group was going to have to start patrolling in the DMZ. He was afraid that he might potentially have to go over to Vietnam. And he thought if he surrendered himself to the North Koreans, it would be a quick ticket back to the United States. And that fear-based decision impacted the next 40 years of his life. He said, I did not understand that the country I was seeking temporary refuge in was literally a giant demented prison. How do you not understand that? Because his mind and his thinking was clouded by his fear. Fear can lead us to make some really short-sighted decisions that can have long-term, even generational consequences. Worse, fear can lead us to disobey the one living, true, and holy God of the universe. Consider how being fearful of being rejected might lead us to disobey God's word to share the good news of the gospel with someone who may need to hear it. Or consider how our fear of not having enough may lead us to hoard our possessions rather than looking for opportunities to share with those who may be in need. Consider how our fear of being alone may lead us to get involved with a relationship that doesn't honor God. Consider the way our fear of the loss of our our liberties or the loss of our money or maybe even the loss of our lives may lead us into an unholy political alliance with unsavory characters. That's precisely the situation that Ahaz and the people of Judah are in in our story. The people of Judah are under siege, or about to be, and they are scared witless. And rather than allowing their fear to turn them to put their hope and their trust in the living God... They allow their fear to turn them to put their hope in a very unsavory character and kingdom called Assyria. Fear will do that to us. And the implications of that decision will, have, will be carried out through generations. During these next four weeks of Advent, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 7 through chapter 12. And we're going to see how the gracious God that we serve gives his people hope, comfort, and consolation. A hope and comfort they sorely need, but very much do not deserve. And it's a hope and a comfort that's still there for us these many years later. A hope that is particularly relevant in this season of Advent when we remember the people of God waiting for Jesus' arrival the first time, and as we ourselves await his arrival coming the second time. So the first thing we see in our first message in this series is that in times of trouble, we must not be disobedient in fear, but faithful in hope. We must not be disobedient in fear, but faithful in hope. The first uh, point is that in times of trouble, fear is normal. In times of trouble, fear is normal. Now, as we embark on this study in Isaiah chapter 7 to 12, you need to understand this is not easy. This is not low-hanging fruit. We're looking at prophecy. 
It was written a very long time ago in a very different place than we are right now, and it's hard to understand. So my encouragement to you is to grab a pencil. You've got a big blank sheet of paper in your bulletin. You may want to jot down some notes. You may want to sit forward a little bit, lock in, because this is going to be challenging. But you're up for it because you're not weak. You're not wimpy. You're the people of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And this word was written for you and for your good. So are you locked in and ready to go? All right, I'll ask you later too and we'll see. But but I've got confidence that you're ready for this. So let me give you the big picture of what's happening and then we'll start working our way through. By the way, you may want to go back this week and read 2 Kings chapter 16 and 17 because this is a, that's a narrative portion of scripture that will give you a lot of insight into the events that are happening in Isaiah chapter 7 to 12. So that's 2 Kings chapter 16 and 17. But let me give you the big picture and then we're gonna get into the stuff. The big picture is there are three kings that are mentioned in our first verse. There's Ahaz, he's the king of Judah. There's Pekah, he's the king of Israel. Judah and Israel are now separate kingdoms at this point in history. And then you have um, Rezin, who is the king of Syria. Now, complicating this is that they're frequently referred to as the son of so-and-so. And often the name for Israel is substituted by the name Ephraim, or in some cases, Samaria, but it's all talking about the same place. Syria is sometimes referred to as Damascus, but we're still talking about the same place. So those are the three kingdoms we're talking about. There's Judah. These are the good guys. These are the people of God. This is where the descendant of David is still reigning on the throne, even though the king is terrible. There's Israel, which is broken away from the, the, the true people of God. And then you have Syria. Now, there's a fourth king that we're going to encounter who we haven't mentioned yet, but this king and his kingdom are really the driving force behind all the events in this passage. And that is a guy by the name of Tiglath-Pileser. Idea for those of you having children soon and you're looking for a name. (laughs) He's the king of an empire named Assyria. And they are a strong empire and they have their ambitions set on moving into the Fertile Crescent further than where they already are, and taking over Syria, Israel, and Judah. Now, because of that, Judah and Syria, sorry, Israel and Syria, decide they're going to team up together to resist the Assyrian invasion. And they want Judah to be a part of the resistance. Judah does not want to be part of the resistance, but not because they're putting their trust in God, Judah's putting their chips down on Assyria. So they want to go and surrender themselves and become the slaves of Assyria because they think that's their best shot at survival, which does not make God happy. But that's the situation that we're dealing with. The year is 735 BC. So now let's pick up and look at where we are. Verse one, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. So those two kingdoms, Israel and Syria, want to put pressure on Judah to join their coalition, and the way they're putting that pressure on is they've come to Jerusalem, surrounded the city, and they haven't yet been able to attack it. Now, the people of Judah don't realize this is because the Lord is at work on their behalf. Verse two, when the house of David, that's Ahaz's house, the house of Judah. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, which is Israel. (laughs) This could have been simpler, I think, but I trust God has our best in mind here. When when they heard this, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. So they give word. The the enemies have surrounded us. And the king of, of God's people, Ahaz, in his house, they're trembling in fear. They are shaking at the fact that these enemies are at the gate. Now, fear is normal in scary situations. It's a normal reaction, but how we respond to that fear makes all the difference in the world. Fear can lead us to put our trust in God or fear can lead us to abandon God and put our trust somewhere else. 
King Ahaz being a wicked, evil, not godly king does not turn and put his trust in God when he's afraid, but instead turns and reaches out to the wicked Assyrian empire and puts his hope and trust there. Well, where do you put your trust when you're afraid? In times of trouble, what do you look to for your sense of security? When your personal life or the world in which you're living isn't going the way you want, where do you look to for a sense of security, comfort, or to see things turned around? Oswald Chambers most famous for writing my utmost for his highest, also wrote this. He said, it's the most natural thing in the world to be scared. And the clearest evidence that God's grace is at work in our hearts is when we do not panic. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. That's, that's the heart of this whole passage. What do you fear? Whom do you fear the most? If you have a proper reverential fear of God as the Holy One of Israel, the, the master of the Exodus, the maker of all creation, you will not fear in times of trouble, no matter what people or events are threatening to do to you. But if you do not have this proper fear of God before your eyes, then you will be afraid of everything. Everything can shake you. It doesn't take much at all to shake you. Where are you most tempted to fear? Because that's the place you are going to be most tempted to disobey and to forsake your trust in the living God for something less. So is it, are you afraid of not having enough? Well, that's going to be the place where you are most tempted to put your trust in money rather than putting your trust in the living God. Are you afraid of rejection? Well, that's going to be the place where you're going to be most tempted to compromise so as not to be rejected and do what it takes to make sure you're part of the in group. Are you afraid of being alone? Then you may be tempted to engage in an ungodly relationship so as to make sure that you don't lose what you think might be your best hope of a life with someone else. There are all kinds of ways that fear impacts our lives, but you need to identify where you're most tempted because that's the place where you're going to be most likely to go astray. And instead of going astray and putting your hope in something else, at that very point, when you're afraid, put your trust in him. The second thing we see in this passage is that in times of trouble, faith is firmness. Faith is firmness. We go on and read in verse 3. God sees that Ahaz and the house of David are trembling and fearful, and he wants to encourage them not to put their trust in Assyria, but instead to put their trust in him. So he sends the prophet Isaiah. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub. Another potential name choice. But whether you decide to go with this name or not, what the name means is a, a remnant shall return. And that the very name is a sign. It's a sign both of God's judgment on his people that they're going to go into exile, but it's also a sign of promise that a remnant will return. So Isaiah is to go with his son, Shir Jeshub, and at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, they're going to meet Ahaz. And say to him, be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin in Syria and the son of Remaliah. Because Syria with a frame and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. So Ahaz is hanging out by the conduit where the water is. Why is he hanging out there? Why is Isaiah going to find him there? He's there because he's inspecting the water supplies. The 
Jerusalem's about to be under siege. He wants to know if they're going to have enough water to be able to withstand the siege while they wait for salvation from Assyria. So Isaiah is to go and to meet him at that place. And he's to tell him this message. Do not fear. Don't be afraid. Four different ways he tells him, don't be afraid. Why? Because if you're afraid, you're going to do something dumb. If you're afraid, you're going to do something dumb. And Ahaz is dead set on doing something dumb. You'll you'll see. He says, don't be afraid. And he gives him a reason why. He says, those two people you're afraid of, those two kingdoms, Syria and Israel, they are smoldering firebrands. In other words, they're toast. They're not going to last much longer. You're afraid of them now, but they're not going to be here for long. And he recognizes that this is their plan. Their plan is to go up against Judah, to terrify it. And what they want to do is they want to remove Ahaz from the throne of Judah. And they want to put somebody whose name is is referred to as the son of Tabeel on the throne. Tabeel is probably not this person's real name because it means good for nothing. (laughs) They want to put the son of good for nothing on the throne of God's people. For obvious reasons, because when they put their good for nothing king on the throne of Judah, they will be able to get Judah to do whatever they want Judah to do. Now, Ahaz is a bad, wicked king, and the Bible is absolutely clear about that, but he is nevertheless a descendant of David. And God promised David that he would always have a descendant on the throne. He made a sure promise to David. This is the rightful king of Judah, even though he's terrible. So now you have the purposes of Israel and Syria to dethrone Ahaz and put a non-Davidic ruler on the throne, coming into conflict with God's purposes, which is that he will always have a descendant on the throne. And whose purpose do you envision will prevail? This is what Isaiah says in verse 7. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, it shall not come to pass. Don't be afraid of these guys. They're, they're, they're smoking because they're about to be finished. It will not happen. You will not be unseated from this throne. That's the promise. In fact, he goes on and says in verse 8, the second part, and within 65 years, Ephraim, that's Israel, northern kingdom, will be shattered from being a people. Now, the year is 735 B.C. when this prophecy is delivered. By 722, the northern kingdom of Israel has been effectively dominated by Assyria. By 671, Esarhaddon, a later Assyrian king, has effectively deported, completed the deportation of all of the people out of the northern kingdom of Israel and resettled the land with people from elsewhere So that by this point in history, 671, within 65 years, the people of Israel are no more. They're gone. And all that's left is Judah. This was prophesied ahead of time. This was foretold. And it happened precisely as God said it would. This was not written after the fact, like, let's go back and write a prophecy that looks like we knew this was coming. This was said, and it happened just as the Lord said. His word stands firm. It does not fall short. It doesn't fail. It is always true. It's always fulfilled. And that's why he says in verse 9, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm in faith. You will not be firm at all. If you don't build your life on the truthfulness of God's word, believing it, even when you can't see it, you will not be firm at all. It's amazing. You know, people think that the life of faith as, a, as, as one of God's people in the old, under the old covenant or, or now today, that the life of faith is like, you know, stepping into the dark, but you're actually stepping into the light. You're actually stepping into where you can actually see. And so there's only one firm foundation upon which you can build a solid life in this world. It's on the word of God. It's on the rock of Jesus Christ. And if you stand firm in that faith, the one that's revealed in this word and embodied in the person of Jesus, then you can stand firm in any situation of life. In every time of trouble, in any time of trouble, you can be a firm person, a solid person. But if your life is built on anything else, 
In times of trouble, you will not be solid. Your life will only be as solid as your circumstances. And God invites his people to something better, something firmer, to build their life on him. What are you building your life on today? The best of your ability to design your life in a particular way to try to shield yourself from all trouble? Is it built upon a, a solid nest egg and fi firm financial security? Is it built upon the confidence that your family is going to remain like it is now and forever? Is it built upon you know, your hopes for the government? or what, what are you building your life on? If it's not built on the promises of God written in the scripture, well, you'll not be firm at all. But if it is, then no matter what you face, you will be firm. The third thing we see is that in times of trouble, hope is fitting for God's people. In times of trouble for God's people, hope is fitting. Continue on in verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. God knows Ahaz's heart and he knows that Ahaz has in his mind that he is not building his life on firm faith of God's word, but he's building it on his best political maneuverings, which is to build his hope on Assyria. But God desperately wants his king and his people to trust him. And so he condescends to Ahaz's level and says, listen, I'll move heaven, I'll move earth, whatever it takes, ask me for a sign that what I'm saying is true and I will do it. This is extraordinary humility on the part of the God of all things. To uh, who, is, who is truth. To, to humble himself, whose word is completely trustworthy, and say, I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. He should not have to say that. But he does because he loves his people. Well, how does Ahaz respond? But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. You should want to punch Ahaz in the face because <laughs> he's an idiot. That is dumb. And Isaiah wants to punch him in the face. You can tell when you hear what he says next. This makes God as angry as anything. When the people who are called by his name demonstrate this pious religious hypocrisy, acting like they're too spiritual to respond to God's condescension, I don't need a sign. Why doesn't he need a sign? It's not because his faith is so strong. He doesn't need a sign because he doesn't want to believe God. He's already made up his mind. He's made his plan. His hope is Assyria. God doesn't need to prove anything about his work because he doesn't trust him already. You know, God still condescends to give signs to his people. In particular, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are signs God has given to his church to help strengthen the faith of his people. The, the Lord's Supper that we're going to take later in our service today is a confirmation for our weak faith that God is true to his word that everything that's symbolized in this meal, he will do and deliver. He will give to us. All of the promises of the gospel are signed and sealed and belong to everyone who believes. They're a condescension to our weakness. We should not be like Ahaz and say, well, I don't really need that but rather should recognize our weakness and God's immense love and grace and say, thank you for giving us these signs and seals. And I will make sure I'm here every time they're offered because I need it. To strengthen my faith and to help me to walk in all that they represent. Well, Ahaz refuses the sign. He doesn't want to put the Lord to the test. He quotes Deuteronomy to the author of Deuteronomy. 
And so Isaiah says, Hear then, O house of David, no longer just addressing Ahaz, but the whole house. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. There's a lot here, and a ton has been written on this, and it's a difficult passage. But we're going to try to work our way through it as simply as we can. The first thing you have to appreciate here is that Ahaz refuses the sign that is given to help support his faith and trust in a living God because he's rejecting the living God. God, in his mercy, turns from Ahaz to speak to the house of David and says, despite your rebellion, despite your hard-heartedness, despite your refusal to trust me, I'm going to give you a sign anyway. This is mercy. This is grace. This is a God who is resolutely committed to accomplishing his purposes for his people in this world and will not let their weakness and failure and sin and disobedience stop him. It's amazing. And so he gives this sign. Now, the tricky thing about this sign is pretty much everything about it. (laughs) And uh, let me try to, let me start from the beginning. This sign, we call it the sign of Emmanuel, has one meaning. It means what the name says, God is with us. And therefore, the encouragement of this sign is that because God is with us, we do not need to fear in times of trouble. That's the message that he's giving through this sign. The sign has an immediate fulfillment in the days of Ahaz in the 700s BC. But that doesn't exhaust the meaning of the sign. We know because of what Matthew is going to write some 700 years later about Jesus. So the sign has a single meaning. God is with us, therefore we need not fear in times of trouble, but a double fulfillment, one that happens in the days of Ahaz and one that happens some 700 years later with the birth of Jesus. So that's where we're gonna be going and we're gonna look at these two things together. It's important to understand both of them. The first is, he says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. There's a lot of debate about the translation of that word virgin. Because he doesn't use the more typical word for virgin in the Hebrew language. And so there are some people who are saying the word he uses here is more properly described as young woman. And there's some truth to that. But the truth of that is the young woman, as that word is described, is a young woman of marriageable age who is chaste and pure and therefore a virgin. She's an unmarried woman. And this, this particular translation is emphasizing the fact that she is a, a virgin for an important reason. That virgin is a good translation of this word is demonstrated by the fact that around 200 BC, when some Greek-speaking Jews were translating the Old Testament into the Greek language, they translated this word with the word parthenos, which means virgin. That was 200 years before Jesus. So this is not some attempt by Christians later trying to insert the idea of a virgin birth here. This was translated by Jews some 200 years before Jesus, and they said this is, the emphasis here is on the virginity of the person being referred to. This is important for apologetic reasons. Now, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now look, this particular child is going to eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good before he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted the implication is something's going to happen with this child in the near future from when this prophecy was given that's why we see this as having an immediate fulfillment this is going to happen 
Now, then who is the virgin? Well, the first hearers of this, when they heard that a virgin is going to conceive and bear a child, they probably would not naturally have thought to themselves that she's still going to be a virgin when she conceives. The most natural way that one would hear that is, she is presently a virgin, but at some point she's not going to be, and that's how the conception is going to happen. That's the normal way that you would understand these words if you didn't already have in your mind an understanding about the virgin conception as Mary embodies it. So, likely, Isaiah is speaking, and he is speaking about who will soon, a woman who will soon be his wife, his second wife, the mother of Shir Jeshub presumably being gone at this point. And he's referring to her as the virgin, And that this virgin is going to conceive. Why? Because, as we'll see in chapter 8, Isaiah is going to marry her, do what married people do, and she's going to conceive, and she's going to give birth to a son, and his name is going to be Meher Shalal Hashbaz, which is not Emmanuel. You can appreciate. Nevertheless, he will begin... It will be on the the, the timeline of his life that the events of this passage are going to be played out. So if we look back at verse 16, it says, For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Who are the two kings that they dread? Israel and Syria. And by the time that boy is able to reject the evil and choose the good, which in Jewish thinking was about 12 years, Those two kings that you're afraid of and their land is going to be empty. So it's 735 when he says this. By 722, 13 years later, they're toast. Another fulfillment of God's word. And then he goes on to describe further in these verses the devastation that he is going to bring upon particularly the northern kingdom of Israel. That's what the rest of these verses in this passage are about. So let's look at this. He's giving them this prophecy to build their faith. There's right now in the presence a woman who's presently a virgin, who's going to conceive, have a child, and he's, by the time he's 13, those people you're afraid of are going to be gone. That's the sign that he wants to encourage them with, that God is with you. Do not put your trust in Assyria. So let's look at what's going to happen to those people of the northern kingdom. Verse 18, In that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. They're going to swarm around the people of the northern kingdom and ultimately destroy them. Verse 20, In that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. God's going to bring Assyria. He's going to humble and not just humble, humiliate the northern kingdom. That's what's being emphasized here through the forced shaving of the beard and other body parts is the humiliation that they're going to experience. And why are they going to experience it? Because of their idolatry, because of their refusal to trust God, because of their rejection of the house of David, all the reasons that are laid out in 2 Kings. Verse 21 and 22 speaks about the poverty that they're going to experience. But I want to move down to verse 23 through 25. And he says, In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. This is a place that used to be cultivated fields. He says where there was cultivation and life-giving food, it's now going to be overgrown. Why? Because the people are gone. Because they're dead. Because they've been carried into captivity. Because God's judgment has been poured out on them. And in the place of cultivation and fruitful fields, you now have briars and thorns. Verse 25, And for, as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, You will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. The place that used to be inhabited, that used to be a fruitful land under God's blessing, is now going to be a place pervaded with, three times he says, briars and thorns. I don't think that's random that he chooses to describe the land as filled with briars and thorns. Where do we first hear mention of briars and thorns in the Bible? 
in Genesis chapter 3, in the context of God's curse upon humanity. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, their task was to make the earth the garden, to work it and to keep it and to make the world a fruitful and habitable place. And when they rebelled against God on account of their sin, they brought death into the world. But along with death, he said, in place of the fruitful land, there's going to be thorns and thistles, briars. This is a description of the curse moving back into the place that was experiencing the blessing of God. This is the, this is the effect of sin, a life filled with briars and thorns, with, with all of the consequences of our rejection of God and our refusal to trust him and our putting our trust in other things. Well, this is to give hope to the people of Judah that the ones they're afraid of are about to get hammered, but it's not totally hopeful for Judah either because Judah's on exactly the same track as Israel was. They also are not believing and trusting in the Lord. And this is a warning to them. If they don't turn it around, their future doesn't look any better than this. That's the initial fulfillment of this sign. But it's not the fullness of the sign. There's very little way in which we could say Meher Shalal Hashbaz is God with us. His presence was a reminder that God was with his people. But there was a much fuller sign coming through one who was not simply a virgin when the word was spoken, but when she actually conceived, who would give birth to a son who is not simply a sign that God is with us, but who actually is God with us. He is Emmanuel. Look with me in Matthew chapter one. This is amazing. And you've put in all this hard work for this moment. So listen, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly because he assumed, like we would assume, that she's not conceived because that she's conceived because she's not a virgin anymore. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. This is the final fulfillment of that prophecy. What they only began to taste about God's faithfulness and his willingness to turn the world upside down for the sake of his people, they now see in its fullness that to a rebellious, unbelieving people, God is going to give his own son, truly God with us, truly born of a virgin so that he doesn't carry the sinfulness of our nature in order to turn the world upside down again, to bring judgment upon our enemies in salvation to us. And our enemy is not Assyria, and it's not the Babylonians, and it's not the Medes or the Persians or the Romans. It's sin. And this one, Emmanuel, he will save his people from their sins. That's a merciful God. It's a gracious God. And he has done this. We're not waiting for the sign like these people were. It happened 2,000 years ago. He's already come. This Jesus, born of a virgin, has already lived a life of perfect obedience. He has been the king that 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 the house of David never had until him. A descendant of David. But the embodiment of everything that the king was supposed to be, this one trusted God in times of trouble. He never turned away. He never put his trust in anything or anyone else. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he faced the wrath of God that was due for the sins of of all of us, 
when he should be rightfully fearful, and he was that his sweat was like drops of blood. He continued entrusting himself to God, believing the promise, obedient to the point of death, where they took a crown for this king made out of thorns. The symbol of the curse, he bears it on his head for an undeserving, unbelieving people so that our sins could be taken away. And he dies there, having freed us from our sins by bearing the judgment meant for us in our place. But he doesn't stay dead because he's the living God, living God with us. So he rises again the third day. He comes out of the grave with the promise that he will bring us out of the grave as well. He sins into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God where he reigns in glory. And even as he came the first time humbly for our salvation, he will come the second time in glory to bring judgment upon all his enemies and final salvation for those who have trusted in him. Are you trusting in him? Because these promises are only for those who believe. Only for those who are going to build their life on the firm foundation of the fact that already we've seen these words come to fruition. The word about judgment on the northern kingdom of Israel. The word about the demolishing of them as a people. The word about Jesus being born of a virgin and accomplishing all the work that history says he did. We're still waiting for the fulfillment of the word of his return. But he's never been false to his word once. He is coming and he will save all of those who have loved his appearing and who have looked for and longed for his return. You may be in a time of trouble today. Our lives are frequently filled with trouble, but we don't need to be afraid. And where you feel your fear the most, that place particularly, is where you most consciously need to turn and put your trust in the Lord. He is your hope. Your hope is coming from heaven. He's promised he's coming. He's never not delivered on the words he has foretold. He is coming. He can be trusted. Let's trust him. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the truthfulness of your word. It's your God who does not lie. You can't lie and you don't get it wrong ever. Forgive us for not trusting you. For anyone who's here today, Lord, who hasn't put their trust and hope in you for their salvation, who hasn't yet built their life upon the trustworthiness of your word, I pray that today, even in the quietness of their heart, they might just call out to you and say, open my eyes that I might see. Save me, help me, and that you will answer, O God, according to your mercy and goodness. Even now, as we turn our attention to this table, Lord, we pray that you will set apart this bread and cup from its ordinary use, that you will sanctify them for us to be the spiritual presence of Christ's body and blood, that we will feed upon him in faith. And though we may come weak in faith today, that this sign will strengthen us in our believing, even as we wait for your second advent. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.